Let's imagine for a moment that we are tiny enough to follow a bee into a hive. Usually the first thing we would have to get used to is the darkness. Exploring the world of social insects, chapter 5. The first week at August was a consolation, a pure relief. The world had the world will give you that once in a while, a brief time out. The boxing bell rings and you go to your corner where somebody dabs mercy on your beat up life. All that week no one brought up to my no one brought up my father, supposedly dead in a tractor accident, or my long lost Aunt Bernie in Virginia. The calendar sisters just took us in. The first thing they did was take care of Rosalind's clothes. August got her into a truck and went straight to the Amen dollar store, where she bought Rosalind four pairs of panties, a pale blue cotton nightgown, three waistless Hawaiian-looking dresses, and a bra that could have slung boulders. This ain't charity, said Rosalind when August spread them across the kitchen table. I'll pay you back. You can work it off, said August. May came in with witch hazel and cotton balls and began to clean up Rosalind's stitches. Somebody knocked the daylights out of you, she said, and a moment later she was humming Oh Susanna, at the same frantic speed she'd hummed it before. June jerked her head up from the table where she was inspecting the purchases. You're humming the song again, she said to May. Why don't you excuse yourself? May dropped her cotton ball on the table and left the room. I looked at Rosaline and she shrugged. June finished cleaning the stitches herself. It was distasteful to her. I could tell by the way she held her mouth how it drew into a tight buttonhole. I slipped out to find May. I was going to say, I'll sing Oh Susanna with you start to finish, but I couldn't find her. It was May who taught me the honey song. Place the beehive on my grave and let the honey soak through. When I'm dead and gone, that's what I want from you. The streets of heaven are gold and sunny, but I'll stick with my plot and pot of honey. Place the beehive on my grave and let the honey soak through. I loved the silliness of it. Singing made me feel like a regular person again. May sang the song in the kitchen when she rolled dough or sliced tomatoes, and August hummed it when she pasted labels on the honey jars. It said everything about living here. We live for honey. We swallowed a spoonful in the morning to wake us up and one at night to put us to sleep. We took it with every meal to calm the mind, give us stamina, and prevent fatal disease. We swabbed ourselves in it to disinfect cuts or heal chapped lips. It went in our baths, our skin cream, our raspberry tea, and biscuits. Nothing was safe from honey. In one week, my skinny arms and legs began to plump out, and the frizz in my hair turned to silken waves. August said honey was the ambrosia of the gods and the shampoo of the goddesses. I spent my time in the honey house with August while Rosaline helped May around the house. I learned how to run a steam-heated knife along the stupor, slicing the wax cap off the combs, how to load them just so into the spinner. I adjusted the flame under the steam generator and changed the nylon stockings August used to filter the honey in the settling tank. I caught on so fast she said I was a marvel. Those were her very words. Lily, you are a marvel. My favorite thing was pouring beeswax into the candle molds. August used a pound of wax per candle and pressed tiny violets into them, which I collected in the woods. She had a mail-order business to stores in places as far away as Maine and Vermont. People up there bought so many of her candles and jars of honey she couldn't keep up with it, and there were tins of black Madonna all-purpose beeswax for her special customers. August said it could make your fishing line float, your button thread stronger, your furniture shinier, your stuck window glide, and your irritated skin glow like a baby's bottom. Beeswax was a miracle cure for everything. May and Rosaline hit it off right away. May was simple-minded. She was smart in some ways and read cookbooks nonstop. I mean, she was naive and unassuming, a grown-up and a child at the same time. Plus, she was a touch crazy. Rosaline liked to say May was a bona fide candidate for the nut house, but she still took to her. I would come into the kitchen and they would be standing shoulder to shoulder at the sink, holding ears of corn they couldn't get shucked for talking. Or they'd be dabbing pine cones with peanut butter for the birds. It was Rosaline who figured out the mystery of O oh Susanna. She said if you kept things on a happy note, May did fine, but bringing up an unpleasant subject, like Rosaline's head full of stitches or the tomatoes having rot bottom, and May would start humming O oh Susanna. It seemed to be a personal way of warding off crying. It worked for things like tomato rot, but not for much else. A few times she cried so bad, ranting and tearing her hair, that Rosaline had to come get August from the honey house. 
August would calmly send May out back to the stone wall. Going out there was the only thing that could bring her around. May didn't allow rat traps in the house, so she couldn't even bear the thought of a suffering rat. But what really drove Rosalind crazy was May catching spiders and carrying them out of the house in a dustpan. I like this about May since it reminded me of my bug-loving mother. I went around helping May catch Granddaddy Longlegs, not just because a smash bug could send her over the edge, but because I felt I was being loyal to my mother's wishes. May had to have a banana every morning, and this banana absolutely could not have a, a bruise on it. One morning, I watched her peel seven bananas in a row before she found out found one without a bad place. She kept tons of bananas around the kitchen, stoneware bowls chock full. Next to honey, they were the most plentiful thing in the house. May could go through five or more every morning looking for the ideal flawless banana and one that hadn't gotten banged up by the grocery world. Rosaline made banana pudding, banana cream pie, banana jello, and banana slices on lettuce leaf till August told her it was all right. Just throw the blooming things away. The one it was hard to get a fix on was June. She taught history and English at the local high school, and what she really loved was music. If I got finished early in the honey house, I went to the kitchen and watched May and Rosaline cook, but really I was there to listen to June play the cello. She played music for dying people, going to their homes, and even to the hospital to serenade them into the next life. I had never heard of such a thing, and I would sit at the table drinking sweet iced tea, wondering if this was the reason June smiled so little. Maybe she was around death too much. I could tell she was still bristled at the idea of me and Rosaline staying. It was the one sore point about her about our being there. I overheard her talking to August one night on the back porch as I was coming across the yard to go to the bathroom in the pink house. Their voices stopped me beside the hydrangea bush. You know she's lying, said June. I know, August told her, but they're in some kind of trouble and need a place to stay. Who's going to take them in if we don't? A white girl and an in a Negro woman, nobody around here. For a second, neither spoke. I heard the moss landing against the porch light bulb. June said, we can't keep a runaway girl here without letting somebody know. August turned toward the screen and looked out, causing me to step deeper into the shadows and press my back against the house. Let who know, she said. The police? They would only haul her off someplace. Maybe her father really did die. If so, who is who better is gonna is she going to stay with for the time being than us? What about this aunt he mentioned? There's no aunt and you know it, said August. June's voice sounded exasperated. What if her father didn't die in this so-called tracker accident? Won't he be looking for her? A pause followed. I crept closer to the edge of the porch. I just have this feeling, a feeling about this, June. Something tells me not to send her back to some place she doesn't want to be. Not yet, at least. She has some reason for leaving. Maybe he mistreated her. I believe we can help her. Why don't you just ask her point blank what kind of trouble she's in? Everything in time, August said. The last thing I want is to scare her off with a lot of questions. She'll tell us when she's ready. Let's be patient. But she's white, August. This was a great revelation. Not that I was white, but that it seemed that June might not want me here because of my skin color. I didn't know that this was possible, to reject people for being white. A hot wave passed through my body. Righteous indignation is what Brother Gerald called it. Jesus had righteous indignation when he turned over the tables in the temple and do drove through the thieving money changers. I wanted to march up there, flip a couple of tables over, and say, Excuse me, June Boatwright, but you don't even know me. Let's see if we can help her, August said as June disappeared from the line of sight. We owe her that. I don't see that we owe her anything, June said. A door slammed. August flipped off the light and let out a sigh that floated into the darkness. I walked back towards the honey house, feeling ashamed that August had seen through my hoax, but relieved, too, that she wasn't planning on calling the police or sending me back yet. Yet, she'd said. Mostly, I felt resentment at June's attitude. As I squatted on the grass at the edge of the woods, the pea felt hot between my legs. I watched it puddle in the dirt and the smell of it rising into the night. There was no difference between my piss and June's. That's what I thought when I looked at the dark circle on the ground. Piss was piss. Every evening after supper, we sat there in the tiny den around the television set with the ceramic bee planter on top. You could hardly see the screen for the philodendron vines that dangled around the new pictures. I liked the way Walter Cronkite looked, with his black glasses and his voice that knew everything worth knowing. He was the man who was not against books, that was plain. 
take everything T. Ray was, shape it into a person. Take everything T. Ray was not and shape it into a person and you would get Walter Cronkite. He filled us in on an integration parade in St. Augustine that got attacked by a mob of white people about white vigilante groups, fire hoses, and tear gas. We got all the totals. Three civil rights workers killed, two bomb blasts, three Negro students chased with axe handles. Since Mr. Johnson signed that law, it was like somebody had ripped the side seams out of American life. We watched the lineup of governors coming on the TV asking for calm and reason. August said she was afraid that it was only a matter of time before we saw things like that happen right here in Tiburon. I felt white and self-conscious sitting there, especially with June in the room, self-conscious and ashamed. Usually May didn't watch, but one night she joined us and midway through she started to hum Oh Susanna. She was upset over a Negro man named Mr. Raines who was killed by a shotgun from a passing car in Georgia. She showed a picture of his, they showed a picture of his window, uh, his widow holding her children and suddenly May started to sob. Of course, everybody jumped up like this was an unpinned grenade and tried to quiet her, but it was too late. May rocked back and forth, slapping her arms and scratching her face. She tore open her blouse so the pale yellow buttons went flying like popcorn. I had never seen her like this and it frightened me. August and June each took one of May's elbows and guided her through the door in a movement so smooth it was plain they'd done it before. A few moments later, I heard water filling the claw-footed tub where twice I'd bathed in, hon in honey water. One of the sisters had put a pair of red socks on two of the tub's feet. Who knows why? I suppose it was May who didn't need a reason. Rosalind and I crept to the door of the bathroom. It was cracked open enough for us to see May sitting in the tub in a little cloud of steam hugging her knees. June scooped up handfuls of water and drizzled them slowly across May's back. Her crying had eased off now until sniffling. August's voice came from behind the, the door. That's, that's right, May. Let all that misery slide right off you. Just let it go. Each night after the news, we all knelt down on the rug in the parlor before Black Mary and said prayers to her, or rather the three sisters and I knelt and Rosalind sat on a chair. August, June, and May called the statue Our Lady of Chains, for no reason that I could see. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. The sisters held strands of wooden beads and moved them in their fingers. In the beginning, Rosalind refused to join in, but soon she was going right along with the rest of us. I had the words memorized after the first evening. That's because we said the same thing over and over till it went on repeating itself in my head long after I had stopped mouthing it. It was some kind of Catholic saying, but when I asked August if they were Catholic, she said, Well, yes and no. Mother was a good Catholic. She went to Mass twice a week at St. Mary's in Richmond, but my father was an Orthodox eclectic. I had no idea what sort of denomination Orthodox eclectic was, but I nodded like we had a big group of them back in Sylvan. She said, May and, I, May and June and I take our mother's Catholicism and mix in our own ingredients. I'm not sure what you call it, but it suits us. When we finished saying Hail Mary about 300 times, we said our personal prayer silently, which was kept to a minimum since our knees would be killing us by then. I shouldn't complain since it was nothing compared to kneeling on the Martha Whites. Finally, the sisters would cross themselves from their foreheads to their navels and it would be over. One evening, after they had crossed themselves and everyone had left the room but me, in August, she said, Lily, if you ask Mary's help, she'll give it. I didn't know what to say to that, so I shrugged. She motioned me to sit next to her in the rocking chair. I want to tell you a story, she said. It's a story our mother used to tell us when she got tired of our, chore of our chores or out of sorts with our lives. I'm not tired of my chores, I said. I know, but it's a good story. Just listen. I situated myself in the chair and rocked back and forth, listening to the creaking sound that rocking chairs are famous for. Long, a long time ago, across the world in Germany, there was a young nun named Beatrix who loved Mary. She got sick and tired of being a nun, though, what with all the chores she had to do and the rules she had to go by. So one night, when it got too much for her, she took off her nun outfit, folded it up, and laid it on her bed. Then she crawled out the covenant, covenant window and ran away. Okay, I could see where we were headed. She thought she was in for a wonderful time, August said. But life wasn't what she thought it'd be for a runaway nun. She roamed around feeling lost, begging in the streets. After a while, she wished she could return to the convent, but she knew they'd never take her back.